pleasure uh, to welcome the last speaker, Gabriele Gava, who is based at the University of Frankfurt and who, as you probably know, has done a lot of work at the interconnections of Kantianism and pragmatism. And today he is going to talk about uh, can transcendental idealism be used to ground the autonomy of the human sciences? Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Josefina. So, first of all, let me thank all the people that are present on a Sunday morning here to hear <laughs> my talk and uh, my talk on transcendental idealism and the third antinomy. So, not stuff that normally somebody wants to do on a Sunday morning. <laughs> so then. I want also to ask Giuseppina, uh, Paul, and Alexis for their kind invi invitation. So I'm, I, I'm really happy to be here at this summer school. So I've learned a lot from the, the papers, from the discussion. And I, I'm also happy because this has given me uh, the, the opportunity to, to think about, about problems that, I mean, I've, I've not, uh, on which I, I haven't worked a lot. Uh, uh, in the past, and this, and it has also given me the opportunity to see if a project I'm working on at the moment has uh, implication for the question regarding the autonomy of the human science. Um, so, just a specification: when I talk about, when I say autonomy, when I, sp I when I do not specify what I mean by that. Uh, I mean, I always mean autonomy of the human sciences, never autonomy in the in the Kantian sense of the term itself. So, but let, let me just say a couple of things on the project uh, I'm working on. So, the project is on on Kant's. So, the problem of method in the uh, in the first critique, uh, where the idea is to uh, give an account of what should be the method of philosophy for Kant, uh, especially as it is considering the transcendental doctrine of method of the first critique, and then to see how this account can illuminate even what Kant does himself, what, so what Kant applies himself in the transcendental doctrine of method, in the transcendental doctrine of elements <coughs> of the first critique. Um, so uh, in one central idea, of the book is that in order to uh, so uh, understand what Kant is doing in the transcendental analytic, uh, it is uh, important then to have in mind the kind of problems Kant is considering in the transcendental dialectic. That is the part of the critique of pure reason when uh, where Kant discusses uh, fallacious inferences of reason and the, co the so-called conflict of reason with itself, uh, etc. So what 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 I want to do today is to take into consideration the transcendental uh, uh, dialectic of the first critique and see if there we can find something that could be interesting and, and for the question about the autonomy of the human sciences. In particular, I will take the antinomies into consideration. Okay, so uh, I'll take just some water. So, um, so if if we want to have a closer look at uh, the problem, I so the main idea of the the paper, uh, you can put it as follows. So, if if we uh, consider one of the main uh, role of transcendental idealism in Kant's system, so this role could be put by saying that that transcendental idealism should allow us to all to seemingly inconsistent views on ourselves at the same time, and to do that without contradiction. So on the one end, so this, this inconsistent view would be, seemingly inconsistent view would be on the one end, the possibility to regard ourselves as appearances, then, and as subject to deterministic natural laws, while uh, on, the, uh, the, uh, on the other hand, the other view is the one which sees ourselves as noumena and as free willing agents. Okay, so this is a fundamental um, uh, purpose of transcendental idealism and a fundamental application of transcendental <coughs> idealism for 
So the question is, the, I, is this double standpoint on ourselves relevant for the question of the autonomy of the human sciences? And so the, 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 you can put the question by saying, oh, is this perspective on ourselves as free willing agents something that is essential for the human sciences and so transcendental ideas within the system should provide some grounding for that. So, uh, starting from this uh, problem and this um, um, so way to present it, we can, we can have the following question. So, was one of Kant's purposes, so explicit purposes, that of providing some metaphysical grounding for the autonomy of the human sciences? And, and, and we can also ask, even if that was not one of Kant's explicit purposes, was it a consequence, in a sense, of transcendental idealism that the human sciences had a sort of independent footing? So if we look at Kant's system and you consider which kind of position in this system the human sciences have, so it's that position, in a way, made possible by his doctrine of transcendental idealism. And so the last question is then, even if we do not consider these uh, interpretative uh, issues, interpretative question regarding Kant's views and, and the, the implication of his system, we, we can also ask, okay, independently of this, can we use uh, Kant's insight uh, regarding transcendental idealism to argue for the autonomy of the human science today? So it's, can we develop a form of transcendental idealism which is independent of Kant's particular form of transcendental idealism, uh, which, uh, would, which would have consequences for the autonomy of the human science. Okay, so these are the main questions I, I want to, to ask today. Uh, and I, I, I'll focus more on the first two than to, to on the last. Uh, and, so, and, and I will deal with this question uh, in this order. I mean, I, I will first uh, give a very broad uh, characterization of what uh, transcendental idealism is supposed to be uh, in Kant, then uh, I will consider uh, the problem that Kant discusses in the third antinomy, where Kant then, where the third antinomy uh, is the one in which on the one hand we have uh, the thesis saying that there is a free causation, so spontaneous causation in the world, and the antithesis says uh, that there is no, uh, only, only uh, natural causality in the world. Uh, then I will consider uh, the solution of the third antinomy, um, and, and, and then I will, and, and, and I, I will see also how transcendental idealism has a role in that solution. And then I will see if the third antinomy uh, the solution of the third antinomy, and so the idea of transcendental idealism, which we find there, can be uh, important then for the question of the autonomy of the human science. And we present three problems for sustaining this view on Kant. And uh, to finish, I will really sketch how, how Kant insight might be uh, developed independently of this. So, okay. Okay, so what is transcendental idealism? Uh, for Kant. So, transcendental idealism is first of all a claim about space and time. So space and time are not properties that objects have as they are in themselves. Uh, they are properties that we can attribute to objects uh, insofar as they are intuited through our sensibility. Okay, so, um, um, so they, they are not uh, properties of things themselves, they are properties that objects have insofar as they are intuited by us. But they are not only that, they are in a sense conditioned for our uh, intuition of objects. So uh, they are forms that we, n n we, we must necessarily use to provide order to uh, the objects that are given to us in, in intuition. Um, and 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 from, from this can derive that objects that are given to us in intuition are only appearances, because they are not objects as, uh, as far as they are in some themselves. They are objects only insofar as they agree to the uh, form uh, that, that our intuition of object must necessarily have. 
Okay, and, and Kant then also uh, says that uh, uh, we can only recognize objects that can be given to us in intuition. So the fact that uh, we have intuition of an object is a condition for us for having cognition of that object. So we cannot have cognition of object that it is not, uh, it's not uh, so we cannot recognize object that cannot be given to us in intuition. And from this we can derive that we can only recognize object as appearances and not as thing in itself. Which means that we can only recognize object uh, insofar as they conform to the form uh, of our intuition of object, and we cannot recognize object insofar as they are independently of those form of our um, intuition of object. So the very so we, we, we then obtain the most basic way to see uh, the distinction between appearances and thing in terms of thing can, in which on the one hand we have uh, object insofar as they agree with the with space and time insofar as they are in space and time and object insofar as they are not uh, in space and time insofar they are not intuited by us uh, but Kant um, add some complication to the characterization of the uh, distinction between appearances and things themselves so sometimes it says um, so that uh, Thing in themselves should provide us the matter of intuition, while space and time uh, provide us the form of such intuition. So uh, th this this seems to be a bit more problematic. Uh, but also sometimes it says that thing in themselves <coughs> have uh, some kind of rounding role with respect to appearances, where the basic intuition here is that. If we have something, so if we have appearances, we must have something that appears. Where, however, it's not easy to understand what that means. So, so and given these different layers of the distinction between appearances and things themselves, and so and some sentimental idealism, there are there have been various ways of interpreting the view. Um, where the most basic and more, more uh, most naive one is probably seeing transcendental idealism as involving a kind of phenomenalism, where the claim that we can only cognize uh, appearances as, uh, sorry, we can only cognize object as appearances as they appear to us is taken as meaning that we can only, so that, that our knowledge of objects is basically knowledge about our mental state, that our uh, then our cognition is limited to our own mental state, and and whereas on the other end the thing itself would be an independent thing that has some kind of causal relationship with the with the uh, with the appearances as representation that we have in our mind. So we. So according to this, we, we have on the one end mental state, representational state in our mind, which uh, represent an external object, let's say, and on the other end, we have a uh, thing in itself which, which, which we cannot know, uh, but which have some kind of causal relationship with, with, with our uh, representation as well. Okay, so uh, Kant has been criticized for holding this view by many, uh, but um, so many have also defended him by saying, look, so you're wrong, Kant is not saying this kind uh, of stuff. Um, and so another way to interpret transcendental item is, has been to see the distinction between appearance and thing in himself as involving then uh, epistemological distinction between two perspectives on the object. The idea here is that is on, there is only one object and you can consider it from two standpoints, let's say, as, as the object is in itself, independently of our cognition of it, or insofar as it agrees with the form, uh, or with, the, with the condition for us to cognize it. Okay. So there is then a third, uh, a third option that has been, that has, have, uh, has had some kind of popularity as well, to interpret 
transcendental idealism, which sees the distinction as involving a metaphysical distinction between intrinsic and relational properties of uh, substances. So the idea is that when we consider the object as it is in the itself, we consider the object uh, in regard to its intrinsic properties, which we cannot know. Uh, when we consider the object as an appearance, we consider it um, uh, in, with regard to its uh, relational properties, which we can know. Okay, so this is just to, to give you an idea of the complication about the interpretation of, of um, transcendental idealism as a, and uh, I mean, insofar as it is also, I mean, the, the metaphysical implication of the view are uh, concerned sometimes. Um, I don't want to side or to defend any one of these perspectives. I, I want rather to, to, uh, to focus on what Kant sees, I think, as a consequence of transcendental idealism, which I think can be equally grounded in any one of the reading of uh, transcendental idealism I present. I present, and so this consequence is that um, so the, the certain properties that we must necessarily ascribe to object to uh, necessary conceptual and sensible constraint on cognition apply only to object as far as they are cognizable to us, that is, to appearance. So the idea is that if it is true that we must see the object in a certain way because of conceptual and, and sensible constraint on our cognition of that object, so this necessity that we, um, that we uh, ascribe to those properties apply only to the object as far as they are cognizable. And this then op opens up the possibility to regard the object in, a, in another way, and so to, see, to, to, to say that properties that are not ascribable to appearances because they are in conflict with some of the implication of the uh, conceptual and sensible constraint on our cognition might be ascribable to think in terms of. Okay. So, good. Okay, so this is to to give you an idea of the of transcendental idealism and one implication which which is relevant then for Kant's solution of the uh, third antinomy. Okay, so let's now have a look at the third antinomy. Let 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 us begin by saying a couple of things um, uh, on the antinomies in general. So the antinomies are from Kant. Um, Conflicts uh, between between uh, two two proposition, which are I mean there are a couple of propositions which seems to be equally uh, founded uh, in, in rational consideration, um, and that seems to be mutually contradictory. And it seems that then only one of those can be true, and uh, and and that one of them must be true. But we are in a position in which we cannot decide on the basis of our rational consideration which one is true. And this conflict arises when we apply some of the categories to uh, determine a series in the regress uh, of conditions for explaining a given condition. So the idea is I have something given, which, I, uh, which is what is conditioned for Kant, and in order to explain the possibility of this something given, I try to find out what are the conditions for making sense of this given. And I start then going back in the series of conditions uh, in order to show all the things I must assume to explain the given condition. And for Kant, then, when we do that um, with respect to certain problems, we end up having this then this uh, uh, contrasting uh, views on, on, on the problem, which we have no means to, to decide in a rational way, or, or at least it seems uh, on the assumption of transcendental realism. Okay, so um, just uh, 
couple of things to say uh, in the uh, antinomies in general. Uh, more, I mean, the, the regress in the case of the antinomies concerned the determination of a concept of a ord whole. So the idea of um, determining an, an idea of the world considering its totality, let's say. And so the, and the, the fact that in the antinomies we have this conflict with, this and with these two propositions, which, which seems mutually contradictory, but seems equally rational, etc., is something specific about the antinomies. So it's not, so Kant analyzed other conflict of reason with itself in the, uh, or, or rather, it, it analyzed, he analyzed other um, phalanxious inferences of reason in the, in, the, in the dialectic, but this structure is something specific about the antinomy. And, and the last thing to note in general, I think, is that all the arguments of the antinomies deduce the truth of a certain proposition by arguing for the falsity of its opposite does assuming that either one of them must be true. Okay. This is a fundamental assumption of all the antinomies. So let's, let's move uh, to, to the antinomy itself. And we have the thesis, which says, so causality in accordance with laws of nature is not the only one from which all the appearances of the world can be derived. It is also necessary to assume another causality, true freedom, in order to explain them. Okay, so the thesis says, uh, in order to make sense of um, of um, causality through natural laws, we must assume a uh, a, a non caused cause in the world, a free uh, cause. And the argument uh, works as follows. So it starts by assuming the opposite proposition, as in the case of any antinomy and then of any argument in the antinomies. And it says, assume that there is only causality through laws of nature. So then this implies for everything that happens, there must be a previous state from which it follows in accordance with the laws of nature. So if something happens, I must assume a previous state from which it follows in accordance with the laws of Third step, the state from which something follows in accordance with the laws of nature cannot have existed forever. So here the idea is this. If something happened, it must follow from a previous state uh, according to, to, to natural laws. But this state must also have happened. Otherwise, the second, so the, the effect would have, would, have, uh, would have existed forever. If the, the, the previous state from which something followed would have, would have existed forever, then also the, the effect would have always be there. Okay, that's, that's the idea. So, and from this, you can ob obtain uh, an, an infinite regress, because if you say something happened, you, you must have a previous state. The, this previous state must also have happened. Then it must have followed from a previous state, and so on, and so on, and so on. And, and so Kant concludes, there is never an absolutely first cause and thus no completeness of the series of causes descending from one another. Good. Then Kant uh, goes on, I mean, taking the perspective of the thesis that in saying that everything happens without a cause sufficiently determined a priori. So in this book, this, <coughs> this should follow from D. And here the idea, the basic idea, seems to be that in order to have a cause sufficiently determined a priori, you need a complete series of causes. This is the assumption. Uh, insofar as you do not have a complete series of causes, then the cause for every event must be a cause sufficient, uh, insufficiently determined a priori. Then Kant goes on and says, but the law of nature consists in this. Nothing happens without a cause sufficiently determined a priori. Okay, so it is a requirement of the natural law, of, of a natural law itself, that what happens is sufficiently determined a priori. So, but since then, uh, this is so this contradiction. This is a contradiction with E. E must be false, and consequently also A 
must be false because a uh, so e follow directly from from a so and if a is false it means that we must assume causality true freedom okay good let let's have a look at the antithesis and the argument for it so the antithesis said there is no freedom but everything in the world happens solely in accordance with laws of nature so there is only a uh, natural causality in the world okay let's see the argument so the argument start as in the case of the thesis by assuming the opposite view assumes there were freedom that is a faculty of absolutely beginning a state and a series of its consequences so this implies the spontaneous cause is not caused by a previous state in accordance with natural laws okay so this seems an implication of a. Uh, but Kant says for everything that happens there must be a previous state from which it follows in accordance with the laws of nature so it seems then if we apply uh, this principle to the spontaneous cause uh, that if a spontaneous cause happen there must be a previous state from which it follows in accordance with the laws of nature but B so what B and D uh, sorry, but D and, 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 and B are in contradiction, and since D follow directly from, from, from the natural law, it means that B must f be false, and, and insofar B is basically a restatement of A, also A must be false. And if A is false, it means that there is only causality in accordance with the laws of nature. Okay. Good. So this seems to be the argument for the uh, antithesis. So a couple of things we, we, we should keep in mind. Uh, so the first is that both the thesis and the antithesis try to unpack what is required to account for causality according to natural laws. So the, the argument for freedom that we find in the thesis is also based on the a, a idea of natural law. So it, it wants to show what we must assume to make sense of the natural law uh, of the of causality according to natural laws and this is so um, yeah so the, the difference then in the thesis is just that uh, it says that I, I, in order to make sense of the possibility of uh, of this causality through natural laws we must assume this uh, complete series of condition with uh, an absolutely first cause however there is another uh, sorry. So yeah, um, there is another uh, argument in support of the thesis for uh, so in the in the in the third antinomy, uh, which seems to be based on completely different grounds, and it is not presented as part of the conflict itself. It's something that Kant discusses in the actually in the solution of the of the. Um, um, of the antinomy. And the argument seems to be kind of practical argument for freedom, which is based on Kant's notion of practical freedom. So what is practical freedom for Kant? So uh, Kant says the following in the antinomy, so quote, freedom in the practical sense is the independence of the power of choice from necessitation by impulses of sensibility. The human power of choice is indeed an abridging sensitivum, yet not brutum, but liberum, because sensibility does not render its action necessary. But in the human being, there is a faculty of determining oneself from oneself, independently of necessitation by sensible impulses. So on the most basic level, practical freedom is the capacity to act in a way which is not immediately determined by sensible impulses. So the idea that we, when we have sensible impulses, but we are not determined to immediately act on, on those. Um, and this open up the possibility for some consideration for Kant. So in practical freedom, it's also essential the idea that we can give uh, imperatives to ourselves and, and set out to ourselves. Uh, and on the basis of those oaths, we, we can decide how to act. And so on the basis of a consideration of the oath that apply to our action, 
we can resist sensible impulses and act according to the uh, to the oct. And from from this idea come things. There is an argument for transcendental freedom. At least this this seems to be what I think in the solution of the of the third antinomy. So and the argument goes like this. So practical freedom requires the oct implies can principle. What is the oct implies can principle? The, the idea that when I say that I ought to do something, I am in a position to consider my action that that, uh, that my action in which actually uh, I do not follow the oct and say I ought to have acted in that way. And if I can say that, it means that I can also say I could have acted uh, in another way. And this idea then implies for Kant that the events, the course of event, could have been different. And so you can derive that we cannot make sense of the oath implies Kant principle if we do not assume transcendental freedom, that is the possibility of a spontaneous cause. But we, as human beings, are practically free. So we are able to give uh, hope to ourselves and to decide how to act on the basis of those hoped. Um, and so therefore, we must assume that we are transcendentally free. So if you focus on this argument um, for the thesis, you can obtain a kind of second version of the third antinomy. When on the one hand, you have this practical argument for the thesis, and on the other hand, you have basically the same argument for the antithesis. Um, so now the question is, why, so is this second version of the third antinomy relevant for the question of the autonomy of the human sciences. And it, it, it seems that um, there are, it, it is at least plausible to think that it, it is relevant. Because if it were true that practical freedom is something that at least some of the human sciences assume, then the argument of the third antinomy should provide some room for taking the perspective of practical freedom on ourselves. And what is, it, what is important is that, uh, so for, for this problem is that the, the, the notion of practical freedom that Kant uses in the third antinomy is a very broad notion. So it, uh, he, he uses a very broad <coughs> idea of imperatives and oaths. So it doesn't, it, 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 it. so the consideration is not based only on moral oaths and moral imperatives. But, uh, so in imperatives in general, which could be based you know, on also on on desires, etc., which uh, which are not moral, or which are amoral in a sense, or which are which are not uh, relevant from the standpoint of morality. And this, I think, is important because uh, because it, it, I mean, this perspective on ourselves as rational agent and decide how to act in, in certain way, etc. Uh, and we, we, I mean, we, we, we do that often not on the basis of moral consideration, is something that could be said to be central to the, to the human science. So it's not that the human science take into consideration human agents only insofar as they act morally. Okay, so the fact that Kant uses here a broad notion of practical freedom it so speaks in favor of saying that the, the, the argument of the third antinomy, uh, so the, the, the conflict in the th third antinomy as relevant for the human science as well. Okay. So how does the solution of the third antinomy work? So that's, that's a difficult question. <laughs> and so I, I, I will not give the whole story. <coughs> I, I'll try to give the uh, fundamental intuition in the in the solution, which could be understood on, in a on a more metaphysically uh, strong story, or more on a epistemologically uh, oriented story. So let's first have the uh, the basic idea of the metaphysically 
uh, loaded story. So, so let so I, I read a quote. Uh, if appearances are thing in itself, then freedom cannot be safe. Then nature is the completely determining cause sufficient in itself of every occurrence, and the condition for an occurrence is always contained only in the series of appearances that, along with their effect, are necessary under the law of nature. If, on the other hand, appearances do not count for any more than they are in fact, namely, not for thing in itself, but only for mere representation connected in accordance with empirical laws, then they themselves must have grounds that are not appearances. Such an intelligible cause, however, will not be determined in its causality by appearances, even though its effect appear and so can be determined through other appearances. Thus, the intelligible cause with its causality is outside the series. Its effects, on the contrary, are in contrast <coughs> in the series of empirical conditions. The effect can therefore be regarded as free in regard to its intelligible cause, and yet simultaneously in regard to appearances as their result according to the necessity of nature. So uh, I'll just consider this passage, and I will leave aside all the story about the relationship uh, between uh, intelligible character and empirical character. Maybe we can have a look at that story in the reading group later. But if we if we consider this uh, so this um, uh, quote, the my the main claim seems to be the following. So, if we consider an event as an appearance, then we must say that it follows necessarily from the previous event. Okay. But if we consider that that event as an appearance has also a relationship of grounding with a thing in itself, as, a, as also a grounding relationship with a thing in itself. This means that in order to explain the existence and the possibility of that event as appearance, we must, so part of the explanation comes from its relationship with the thing in itself. And so if we take into consideration this complex re relationship, w we can say that then it means that the event as appearance is left partially undetermined by its relationship with the previous event. And that makes room for causality through freedom from the side of the thing itself. At least this is what is suggested in, in this passage. So there are other passages which suggest other uh, view with their own complication. But let's, let's see the complication of this passage. So the first complication is uh, is this. So insofar the grounding relationship with the thing in itself play such uh, an important role to explain the possibility of, uh, of causality through freedom. It's, it seems that we must have a more fundamental story about how this grounding relationship uh, works. Okay? So we should have a story about that. But th this is not the the main problem, I think. The main problem is that this strategy seems to, to prove a bit too much. Because if it, if it proves that for every event, we can say that it is partially undetermined uh, with respect to the previous event when we consider also the relationship with the thing in itself. So it's, it, uh, it, it seems to, to prove that every event in principle could be, could be derived by a free cause. And that seems too much with respect with what Kant uh, want to say, because he wants to say that some uh, event might be caused by a, um, by a, 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 free, a free cause. OK, so, but, so let's, let's um, leave aside this, uh, this story about the solution of the of the uh, uh, third antinomy based on the idea of the grounding relationship between uh, appearances and, and thing in itself. Um, I think that one can develop Kant's intuition uh, in transcendental idealism uh, in a less metaphysically uh, loaded uh, way. And, and, and have some materials for the solution of the third antinomy, uh, which I think are present in, in, Kant, in Kant's solution. But in Kant's solution, they are also mixed with this 
this more metaphysically um, uh, oriented story. So let's recall one important aspect of transcendental idealism. So transcendental idealism was connected to the idea that the necessity we must ascribe to certain properties of object is to, to uh, so when the necessity we must ascribe to certain properties of object uh, is due to necessary conceptual and sensible constraint on our cognition of those objects, then we must um, we must see that necessity as limited to uh, to those objects insofar as they are cognized by us. Okay, so insofar as the necessity of this constraint applies only to objects as cognized, we cannot extend this necessity to objects as such. And so from this intuition, we can obtain an argument for the solution of the third antinomy, which works a bit like that. So, so events in nature necessarily happen uh, in accordance with natural causal law. So this is something we must assume. And also, the, um, so both the argument of the thesis and the, uh, and the antithesis assume that. The necessity of this principle, however, follows from the necessity to apply the category of causality to determine objective time relationship among objects. Okay, And here we have the idea then and the necessity of the principle follows from conceptual and sensible constraint. So the category and, and, uh, and time as a form of our intuition. But objects in time are only appearances, because time is a property that objects have uh, only so far as they are intuited by us. So therefore, the necessity of the principle should be restricted to objects as appearances. And this... Uh, is supposed to make room for causality through freedom when objects are not considered as appearances. Okay, good. So this is really to give you an idea of the problems of uh, the third antinomy uh, and how the problem can be presented and how transcendental idealists could do some work for the solution of that antinomy. So now let's see if all this story can be relevant for the autonomy of the human science. Yeah. And so the idea here uh, is that, so let's recall that if it is true that practical, so if we focus on the second version of the th uh, third antinomy when we have the thesis based on the, on the idea uh, of practical freedom, so it's, so it, it seems at least plausible that, that t t t the third antinomy and uh, the solution of the third antinomy might be uh, might be relevant for the autonomy of the human science on this ground. So, so if, if it is true that practical freedom is something that at least some of the human science assume, and if it is true that in order to, to see ourselves as practically free, we need the story of transcendental idealism, uh, then the argument of the third antinomy and the solution of it through transcendental idealism might be relevant for, for, for the autonomy of the human science. And so and also let's recall that uh, so one one important aspect uh, to to um, to regard the, the third antinomy as relevant for for the question of the uh, uh, autonomy of the human science was that the, the notion of practical freedom that Kant used there was a really broad notion which was not only limited to moral uh, agency but to rational agency more broadly construed. And this is, seems to be a perspective that is fundamental in general for the human science. At least it's plausible to think. Okay, so starting from this consideration, uh, it seems that in fact there is some evidence that Kant took uh, the, the questions about the autonomy of the human sciences uh, and, and the idea that the standpoint we have in, in those sciences uh, on ourselves as a rational agent had to be defended. And an argument to this effect can be, um, can be found in what uh, Thomas Sturm has called Kant's irrelevance argument against physiological uh, anthropology. So I will follow uh, 
storm analysis in this part of the paper. So what is physiological anthropology? So physiological anthropology was a discipline that developed in Europe in the um, uh, 18th century, uh, in Germany, but not only in Germany. And the, 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 what it did was to try to study the empirical discernible relationship between mind and the body. So how change in the body resulted in change in the mind. Um, so, and in doing that, it contrasted psychology of that time, uh, which were giving explanation of mental states on the basis of a theory of mental <laughs> faculties. And it, so they tried to provide a theory of mental state, not, I mean, not really to provide a theory of mental state, but at least to, to see how um, part of our mental state could, could be determined by uh, changes in, in, uh, in the body. Okay, good. Uh, and Kant provides, so th there, were, there were various arguments uh, in, in the 18th century against this approach, so the idea that it is, uh, it is a proper method to use in psychology just to, to study how uh, changes in the body might affect changes in the mind. Uh, and Kant also provides an argument against uh, against physiological anthropology, but uh, so according to Sturm, at least Kant's argument is uh, original with respect to to other to other argument in 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 that time. And according to Sturm, this argument is actually much better than than the argument that were used by other people uh, in that period. Okay, this is. Uh, so the argument is actually much more uh, complex, but uh, if you put it uh, in its most basic form, it goes um, a bit like that. So pragmatic anthropology, which is Kant's, uh, Kant's name for anthropology, studies human beings as free rational agents. So information regarding how changes in the body result uh, in changes in the mind does not help explain human action as action. And so in, in so far as this is the perspective of, philosophic, uh, of uh, physiological anthropology, uh, then physiological anthropology is irrelevant for pragmatic anthropology. Okay, good. So what, what, what should we learn from this argument? So first, it seems in fact that Kant think that uh, the, the the perspective on our, ourselves as practical, uh, as practically uh, free and as free agent is something essential also for anthropology, so for a human science in, uh, in Kant. And it, it seems also that he, uh, he is in the business of defending uh, this perspective from, from attempts to explain uh, agency using some kind of natural explanation of agency. Okay. So if you, if you take these uh, elements, you might say, okay, then my, it, it might make sense to see transcendental uh, idealism as uh, part of the story. Uh, why Kant wants to, to defend the perspective on ourselves uh, as free rational agents uh, in the human side. Okay, good. However, there are three problems, I think, for, uh, for people trying uh, to say that um, transcendental idealism is explicitly or not explicitly of something that, that can't want to, I mean, if the autonomy of the human science is something that can wants to defend through, uh, through transcendental idealism and through the strategy he uses also uh, to solve the, the third antinomy. So the first problem is this. So Kant does not seem interested in giving a comprehensive characterization of the human sciences, which indicates what they have in common and distinguishes them from the natural sciences. So the, the question about what is a human science and uh, uh, why it is still a science and 
why in this in its scientificity it can be considered as autonomous from the natural science, it's not a question that can explicitly address at least. So the, the most detailed characterization of science we find in Kant is uh, in the Metaphysical Foundation of Natural Science. And you can say, okay, it's a book on natural science, so it's, it's obvious that it, it doesn't say anything uh, on, on human sciences there. But still, the fact that we do not have anything similar for the human science is also telling. So and, uh, but I mean, there you also say something on science in general. So and we can also take that part as relevant. So it, it says, first of all, that science in general and in a broad sense is systematic knowledge. So if you have a discipline which provides some kind of systematic ordering of its doctrine, you can, in a broad sense, already call it a science. However, it provides a very uh, demanding uh, characterization of what is proper science. So, and it, it says that proper science is systematic and a predictive knowledge based on a priori principle. Okay, so uh, you need a predictive knowledge and a predictive knowledge which is based on a priori principle. So, and then what is a proper natural science? A proper natural science is a, is a, is a systematic and a predictive knowledge which has nature either as extended or, or as thinking as an object. And another, another element there is that in, in proper natural science you need also mathematics. Uh, in it, so, um, and the, 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 the there was a quote about that in in uh, in Paul's paper yesterday. Okay, so what are the problems then here? So the first problem for seeing Kant as interesting in the question of the autonomy of, you, of human science is that Kant offers a very demanding characterization of proper science. So it seems that. Um, if we take his anthropology or, or his history as human science, you might say, okay, it's difficult to see them as sciences in this strong, strong sense of the term. So they might at best be something like sciences in a broader sense of the term. Uh, and, and then the, the second problem is that Kant does not seem to be equally interested in providing a unitary description of the human science as is providing here a unitary description of the natural sciences. And so and these two elements to, together seems to suggest that Kant was not interested in defending the scientific character of the human sciences as in sciences in, do in this strong sense of the term, while on the other hand also showing that they are based on um, different principles with respect um, to, uh, to the natural sciences. Okay. So there is a second difficulty, which is based on Kant's account of belief, or Glaube, so, uh, and on his critique of the people who use that concept to distinguish historical knowledges and historical cognition uh, from other kind of cognition, and historical sciences for, from other uh, kind of cognition. Okay, so. What, what was Glaube or belief in 18th century Germany and in Kant? So, uh, um, a characterization of Glaube that you often find in, uh, in that period is, is the one which sees it as a positive proposition, an attitude toward a proposition which is based on testimonial evidence. So when you have a certain belief, let's say in a broad sense, uh, which is based on the testimony of another person or testimony of a document, the, the, the correct way to characterize that attitude you have uh, is to call it a um, belief in the technical sense or a glaub, let's say a glaub for, for, um, for, for, the, for, the, for these people. And so, and this had consequence for the way in which history was accounted for by many. In, in that time. So, so far as history was considered a science based on testimonial evidence, so on documents, uh, documents and etc. So Glaube was considered the correct way to characterize the attitude we have toward claims we make in history and in, in historical science. 
Okay, so good. What is Glaube for Kant? So uh, Kant uh, takes the concept of Glaube and change it and it, it, it made it uh, an essential uh, element in his, uh, um, in his philosophy, in his system, uh, especially for the, yeah, uh, I mean, let, let's not go into those details, but let, let's see what, what, what is Glaube for Kant. So Glaube is positive propositional attitude toward theoretical proposition, that is toward proposition which says how things are, which is undecided given the evidence we have, but which we have practical grounds for belief. So if we have a proposition which we cannot decide if it is true or false on the basis of evidence we have, but we have practical grounds to believe it is true, the kind of uh, attitude we have toward that proposition is an attitude of cloud. Uh, okay, so uh, so Kant used Glaube to characterize the attitude we should have toward propositions <coughs> regarding the thing in itself, which um, which are undecided given the cogni cogni our cognitive faculties. So, for example, um, the proposition regarding the existence of God or the existence of uh, mm, or the immortality of the soul, etc. Uh, so are undecided given, uh, and necessarily undecided given the, uh, the our cognitive capacities. But how, uh, so if we have practical and moral grounds to believe in those propositions, we can then have an attitude of Glaube, or in this case they would be called moral, uh, kind of Glaube, moral belief in Kant. Okay, good. So Kant explicitly rules out the possibility of using Glaube as an attitude to distinguish the historical sciences from, from, the, uh, from other kinds of sciences. So he says the following. So a quote, so-called historical belief, Glaube cannot really be called belief either and cannot be opposed as such to knowledge since it can itself be knowledge. Holding to be true based on testimony is not distinct from holding to be true through one's own experience, either as to degree or as to kind. So what are the problems then for seeing Kant as uh, using transcendental items to defend the autonomy of the human science? So the first problem is that Kant rules out one way to single out what is distinctive in historical Sciences and uh, rules out a way to you know distinguish historical sciences from other kind of sciences, and it does not provide a direct alternative. Okay, so in that context at least, and in that context, it actually says that insofar as our attitude in historical science and in empirical science are concerned, we can have the same attitude. So, so they are on a par with at least in that in that respect. There is. There could be, however, a more fundamental problem. And these, I think, are in, in, in this respect, it, there is room for, for debate and for various considerations. But so it seems that for Kant, Glaube is the kind of attitude we should have uh, toward the proposition that we are transcendentally free. Okay, good. And if this is a proposition, and it, 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 it so, so this is. Um, so this is the, the kind of uh, attitude we should have toward this proposition, and it seems that transcendental idealism has a role in making room for us to take in this perspective with respect uh, to, uh, so with, uh, with regard to that proposition. Okay? Transcendental idealism allows us to, to, have, to rationally have a belief regarding uh, our status of ourselves as free agents. So, and if, if, if then the perspective on ourselves as, uh, as, so if it is true that transcendental idealism should have some role in, uh, in, in letting us have um, a perspective on ourselves as free willing agent also in the, in the, uh, in the human science in a similar way in which uh, in the in the in the in the third antinomy, uh, 
so Kant is using transcendental idealisms to make room for a global in our uh, belief, then why is the, the attitude which is correct in, uh, in, in, uh, in w which we should aspire to in, in history, the one of Wissen? So is, is this clear? Is it a bit complicated? Is, is it clear, clear the idea? Okay, good. Uh, good, then, so this is the second problem. The, the, the third uh, problem is the following one. So, uh, so I've suggested that one reason why the third antinomy might, might uh, be seen as relevant for the, for the autonomy of the human science is the kind of, uh, so is the notion of practical freedom that can't use that. It is a very broad notion of practical freedom which regard ourselves as rational agents uh, in general, and it's not, so practical freedom is not only uh, related to moral agents, okay, but also to agency which might be irrelevant from the moral perspective. And this is, this, the idea was that this is in fact a perspective that we, we seems to be central to many of the human science. Okay, good. However, Kant in later works on practical philosophy seems to use a more uh, a stricter notion of uh, practical freedom. And, and so which suggests that we can consider ourselves as practically free only when we act morally, okay? Only when we uh, consider, um, so only w w when we act uh, on the basis of moral consideration, okay? And so this seems to be a problem for the idea that uh, transcendental um, idealism <coughs> and the solution of the third antinomy might be relevant for, uh, for the autonomy of the human science because if the idea is that uh, that it is practically f practical freedom which requires transcendental freedom and so it is for that reason that transcendental idealism is necessary uh, um, so, so let me put in another way so uh, if, if uh, transcendental idealism is only necessary to ground the possibility of moral uh, uh, consideration, it means that it is not necessary for the kind of rationality that is, uh, in the majority of cases, uh, used in the, in the human sciences. So it would be, transcendental idealism would be only necessary for, to account for those cases in the human sciences which would require some kind, so some attributing some kind of moral, uh, <coughs> moral reasoning to the agents that are considered, but it would not be relevant for all of these cases in which the actions we are considering are rational in a broader sense of the term, but are not based on moral oaths. Is that clear? Okay. So okay, so this is just to uh, so make the thing a bit more problematic, and uh, I, I think that if you take all this stuff into consideration, uh, y you have a really complicated picture, and it's hard to. <coughs> so it seems that at least uh, you can rule out that the, the autonomy of the human science is something that Kant was interesting in explicitly. Um, arguing for, but, uh, but it, I mean, I think that the issue whether it is in a sense uh, implied in the system is really open to debate, and you should consider all these problems when, uh, when dealing with it. Okay, so let me, so how I am about times, it's, it's fine, okay. Can, can yeah, I guess go. Fi five minutes, can, yeah. so it's just, so, l l so I want us to suggest one way in which Kant's insight might be developed, uh, and uh, so in a way that is not uh, based on, for example, Kant's view on space and time, but which, in a sense, involves the insight we find in, in transcendental idealism, uh, and 
which I mean, in a way that would also be relevant for the autonomy of the human science. So, so recall that one fundamental idea of Kant's transcendental idealism, or a fundamental consequence, was that the necessity we must ascribe to certain properties of object is due to the to necessary and conceptual, conceptual and sensible constraint on our cognition of those objects, which for Kant seems to imply that uh, insofar as this necessity uh, applies only to object as cognized, we cannot extend it to object as such. And so this uh, made room for another, for attributing other, other properties to the object insofar as they were considering them. Okay, so one way to develop this insight independently of, of Kant might be to, to build um, so to, 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 to build an argument for the autonomy uh, of the human science based on contingent theories of the a priori. So like the one defined by Friedman, or more recently uh, by Hazu Chang with relationship uh, to what, so for example, um, so some, so, um, so to, to C.I. Lewis' conception of the pragmatic a priori. So um, the, the main idea, uh, in this account is that if you, if you take the proposition you have in certain sciences, you can single out certain propositions that are justified not on the basis of evidence, of empirical evidence, but on the basis of the constitutive role they play for the very possibility of that uh, science. Uh, and, and so here you have a contingent a priori because those propositions are on the one hand justified a priori because they are justified on the basis of a constitutive rule, but they are contingent because uh, so sciences are historical entities which might evolve in time, might change their fundamental uh, concept, etc., and proposition, etc. And there is, I think, still an insight of Kant's transcendental idealism in this because if it is true that you can attribute certain properties of object within those signs because they, they rest on the proposition that are justified on the basis of their constitutive role. So it, it seems to mean that so the justification to attribute that uh, those properties to, to the object insofar as they are considered by those signs is linked to the constitutive role of those propositions in the science, which might be used to, to argue that you are no, not equally justified to use the proposition to determine which object, so which properties you can attribute to object when the objects are considered outside the perspective of those signs. And so in, using this, this intuition, you might develop an argument along these lines. So this is really l rough, so, but we might, so we, we might want to, to, to see in the discussion if that might work out. So, so the idea is that if we are able to show that the justification of certain proposition in the natural sciences, which threatens the autonomy of the human sciences, is linked to the constitutive role they play for those very natural sciences. So this might be used to dissolve the threat which those propositions pose to the autonomy of the human sciences. So if we are able to show that the justification we have uh, to use uh, certain proposition to judge um, how object should be from the perspective of the, or must be from the perspective of a particular natural science, is linked to the constitutive role of those propositions uh, in, in that natural science, and it, it, it is, so it is this proposition that, that creates problems for the autonomy of the human science. So we, we might use the idea, so the, 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 the consideration of this justification and where it comes from, and of where it comes from, to argue that we are not equally justified to use those propositions to determine which object are proper and possible in the human sciences. This is the main idea. Okay, this is really rough, and and uh, and of course m one should work out the details uh, well. So, but but I think this is at least one possible way in which um, 
so the, the intuition in, can, can, in kind of transcendental edges might be developed uh, in a more modest form, maybe. Okay, so let me conclude very briefly. So, uh, so I'll say just a couple of things. So, first is so it seems that Kant was not really interested himself in defending the autonomy of the human science. It was basically not a problem for him. Uh, the question whether so the autonomy of the human science uh, and the, 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 the fact that transcendental idealism might have some role in providing some, some, some space for the autonomy of the human science within Kant's system is, I think, more complicated. There are elements that speak in favor uh, of this view, like Kant's argument against uh, physical, uh, physiological anthropology. There are, so there are elements that speak uh, against this view, like what Kant says on Glaube, or, 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 what, or how he characterized practical belief in, in, in later times. So, but independently of these issues, these interpretative issues in, in, in Kant, it seems that seems to me that the so looking whether transcendental ideas might be developed in a more modest way along the line of the contingent a priori story uh, can actually have some some important things to contribute to the question of the autonomy of the human science. So, thanks. Should I go back? Yeah, yeah, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so these? Okay. Um, yes, exactly. That uh, he uh, can seem to link uh, his idea of uh, of um, uh, human uh, as an agent to more morally um, uh, more moral theories, more morally uh, considered theories. Uh, so in this sense. The idea of, uh, of, uh, of a human science focused on, on, on the agent seems to be too much linked to a moral uh, aspect. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, it's not so much a problem in the sense mm -hmm. uh, we could even find a problem if we remain in the definition of agent as being we can be start a, a causal change uh, mm -hmm. chains in nature uh, because we could even apply this in nature then. I mean in the if we look uh, in the I mean in the in later conception of nature in the critical of the of, uh, of the judgment, it seems that in nature we can even find some kind of uh, autonomy in the sense that it, it can start in nature we can start uh, we can find some bit uh, which can start a casual change in, in nature. Uh, I don't know if it fits in. Yeah, yeah, but I yeah. Think maybe. Yeah. So. And and maybe we, we could we could as we could accept this view that uh, the idea that um, the, the man uh, as agent for Kant must necessarily be connected with a moral uh, view because when we consider men as uh, agents, we must consider men as morally dri yeah. derived yeah. agents, and this doesn't mean that we must as human scientists must be. Um, we must do moral, but we must consider uh, being 
Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think I've got the point. So, uh, um, <coughs> so sorry, I. I uh, the first was uh, uh, why, um, why, why to say that Kant doesn't, he was not interested in the human. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I didn't want to suggest that Kant was not into the business of uh, developing human sciences. So he has stuff on anthropology, he has stuff on 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 history, etc. What I wanted to suggest it for him it was not a problem to defend the autonomy of those sciences from the um, the natural sciences. But, but we could say that uh, his um, anthropology was exactly that. Yeah, yeah. I think now. So um, maybe I can make the point clearer. Responding to the, the second question. So, um, so the idea is that if we look at the later conception of practical freedom in Kant, it seems that it is only when we consider moral oaths that we can. So, and if it, if 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 it is true, I mean, it's it's open to debate, but it is only when we consider our agency on the basis of moral oath that we can apply the oath imply can principle to uh, to see then the, uh, and from that to, to argue that for moral action we need to see ourselves as transcendentally free. Okay, that's the point. So. If it is, if this is true, see, uh, so, so if it is only moral action that requires transcendental freedom and not action in a broader sense of the term, it seems that for many action that anthropology considers, for action that are based on uh, um, on hypothetical imperative, so if I want to reach, uh, you know, if I want to lose weight, I should not eat. I, I ought not to eat many carbohydrates, let's say. Okay. Yeah, I can build an oath on, on this. And for if for those kind, 